Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank John for inviting me to this conference. It's always a terrific event. We started out the conference with Katie's paper talking about joint retirement of husbands and wives, and Joanna commented that they might want to retire jointly to play with grandchildren or to care for grandchildren, and what a fun experience that was. This is a very similar idea, but coming at it from a less sort of happy event, but the idea that you may have to leave work to care for an elderly parent or to provide some care for them going forward. Okay. So just to give you an idea of the importance of informal care, this looks at of those receiving long-term care, help with ADLs, activities of daily living, you see the vast majority are receiving informal care only, or at least some informal care. Only 8% receive exclusively formal care, so paid caregivers. So informal care is a really important part of dealing with the elderly. And if you look at the cost of this care, long-term care is a really important part of our health care expenses. What people pay for out of pocket is about 9% of uh, health care costs in the U.S. Nursing homes now average over $80,000 a year. So it's very expensive, and that's one of the reasons why we rely so much on informal care, because it costs so much to have professional care come care for an elderly parent. Now, if you try to approximate the cost, do a back-of-the-envelope calculation of the cost of informal care, what people have done is look at the number of hours of care provided by family members, multiply that by a standard wage rate for home health care aides or something like that, and then you get a number that just swamps anything we do with formal care. These are based on old numbers. There are new ones that are much, much higher, close to $500 um, billion a year. So this is a huge co cost to the economy. You can imagine if people are leaving, taking time off, cutting back on hours, we're losing workers. And that's part of what this conference is about. How do we keep people working longer? So this can be an important issue. But how important it is really depends on who those people are who are providing this care. Are they people who had weak attachments to the labor force, who were in and out, maybe not working at all? And so in some sense, you're freeing up paid caregivers by drawing on this untapped resource, family members who weren't employed. But if they're leaving high-paying jobs in the skilled labor market to stay home to help care for a parent or cutting back on hours to do that, then we're really losing an important source of economic activity. So what we want to do here is start looking at who are those caregivers. And just to give you an idea on how important this might become in the future, as I said, this is growing. More recent numbers show much higher value. What's happening over time is we've made huge progress in heart disease. We're making progress in cancer. Those are deaths that don't require long-term care. They're sort of rapid. As we move to a case where people are more and more likely to live to advanced ages where they're going to have dementia or some type of issues like that, our need for long-term care is only going to grow. And this is going to get to be a more important phenomenon. So just to give you an idea, these are British data. They just they came out fairly recently. This shows the steep decline in heart disease. This is for men. And the slight rise in deaths from dementia. But if you look at women, now women are more likely to die from, dementia, from Alzheimer's disease or dementia than they are from heart disease. So making progress against heart disease, against cancer, against those sorts of events is you know, great news, but it does mean we're living longer till we get to a point where we're more likely to need this long-term care that could go on for periods of time. If you ever go back and look at applications for long-term care insurance policies, I've done work with Gopi, and we all know that very, a very small fraction of people actually buy long-term care. But on the applications, they do lots of things to try to assess whether or not you might be sort of this type of burden. Are you likely to have some sort of cognitive impairment? One company asks you to write an essay in your own handwriting, and they try to get at this. Because if you're going to be in a nursing home for a couple of months after some major event, that's fine. That's not a problem for them. If you're going to be in for five or six years with some sort of dementia, that is definitely a problem. Okay, so as I said, the cost of caring de caregiving depends on who actually are 
these caregivers, full-time career job people with a higher opportunity cost of time or a weaker attachment to the labor force. And it also depends on the long-term effects of this caregiving. Not just do they have to take you know, some time off now. We saw yesterday again in one of the papers that just working an extra few months can make up for a big difference. So if you're reducing hours for a year or so to care for your elderly mother, can you make it up later? Can you work an extra year, an extra six months, and sort of catch up? Or are there long-term consequences? We were just talking in the previous two papers ago about discrimination for older workers. If a woman takes time off to care for her mother, can she go back into the labor market? Can she get a job? Is she going to be hired at an older age? So these are all important things. Trying to understand what the long-term effects of these are, as well as just the immediate term. I'm going to focus on women in this. If you look at child caregivers, about 70% of children who care for an elderly parent are women. And if you look at children in law, it's 85%. So it's a vast majority of these caregivers are women, and we'll focus on them in the sample. We've done a lot of this work with men and are going to write up a comparison paper, but haven't gotten there yet. So looking at the labor supply effects, certainly changes in labor force participation. Are they working or not? Um, change in hours worked, but also a decline in earnings growth. You could imagine that you're staying on your job, but you're not taking that extra assignment. You're not working overtime. You're not going to get a promotion. You're not going to get as large wage increases for a couple of years because you're, you're sort of distracted. You're taking time off. You may be leaving early on occasion to go to doctor's appointments and things like that. And then there's also this issue of benefits. If you cut back, if you go part-time, do you lose health insurance? If you have a defined benefit pension plan and you leave the job sort of before a certain age, are you going to lose out a lot on benefits? So there are a lot of other costs that you might not see if you just look at sort of one period what happens to somebody's employment. And then there are also concerns about health. And there's been a lot more work in the literature on this, and we're not dealing with it here but about an increase in stress and depression for caregivers, increase in high blood pressure, worse self-reported health. But the literature looking at actual co conditions diagnosed by doctors not found anything. There's an interesting study years ago um, by Douglas Wolfe at Syracuse, and he looked at the stress felt by children who were caring for an elderly parent, and then also the stress felt by their siblings. And siblings who were not the caregivers themselves actually were more stressed because they were suffering with a parent who was declining rapidly, but they couldn't do anything. So this whole idea of having some control and being able to do something, that seems to help. So that's an interesting aspect of health here that hasn't been studied much. So we're using the health and retirement study, starting just the original cohort. We want to look at people over time. So just people who were interviewed in 1992, followed throughout until 2010, women only, and we require that they have a living parent or parent-in-law in the first wave of the survey and were not initially providing care. So we're trying to look at people who would not have been affected by caregiving in the past. Unfortunately, we don't know if they did provide care before the survey began. So they could have had an episode of care back in 88, 84, at some time previously. That we don't know, but they're not providing any care in 92. And they have the potential for having to do so because they have parents or parents-in-law. So it's a nice balanced sample with a little over 1,500 women. Okay, the question, uh, did you or your husband, or, or his wife, partner, spend 100 hours or more since the previous wave or the last two years helping with basic personal needs, dressing, bathing, eating, and so forth? And then follow-up questions, let us know who provided the care, to whom it was provided, and the number of hours. So we're going to do three different things. First, we're just going to use what's typical survey data. We're going to control for labor force attachment. We're trying to see who, if the people who provide care have a stronger attachment to the labor force or a weaker attachment. This has been the problem in estimating this endogeneity. Are people providing care because they had free time, so it's low cost for them to do it? Or are we, do people leave the labor market because they have to provide care? So we're going to look at past histories. We have tenure on their longest job, we have experience at the start of the survey, so we can use those as standard measures. The second thing we'll do is we have the restricted social security data, so we can go back sort of throughout their lives and look at their earnings history. We control for the quarters of coverage, 
from 25 to 44, well before their parents should have needed care, their average quarterly earnings over that time period, and their expected PIA. And we vary this window of time, and it doesn't change the results at all. So you could sort of think of a story that it might be a woman who took time off to raise children early on in her life, went back to work part time, sort of expecting she'd care for an elderly parent later on and so forth. So she was in and out of the labor force versus somebody who from age 25 onward basically was full time and worked throughout that. So they would have much higher values in terms of, quarters of, in terms of average quarterly earnings and expected PIA. So this just shows you the distribution of care by wave. See, nobody's providing care in the beginning. That was based on our selection. Then it typically averages about 10% per wave. Okay, and it rises as parents get ill, then it starts declining as parents die. And this is the probability of ever providing care. So about 46% of our sample provides care at some time over these 10 waves or 20 years of the HRS. So that's a big fraction. It's conditional on having parent alive, but remember, not providing care originally. So it would be higher if we were able to look back and see if people provided care before the HRS started, before 1992. So we're already looking at a significant fraction of the population. And we're not looking at spouses here, but just to give you an idea, this red line is whether or not you provide care for a spouse. So it's relatively low until you get into the retirement years. So that's why we're not looking at it, because we're looking at the effect on labor market behavior. So if you're going to be caring for a spouse, it certainly could be a physical burden and all that. But if it's not coming to your 70 or so, it's not going to affect employment as much as caring for a parent, which is that blue line. So this is hours of care, conditional, unconditional. The little blue ones are unconditional with all the zeros averaged in. And then the pink ones, the yellow ones up there are conditional. You can see it goes up to about 1,000 hours over a two-year period, which is about 10 hours a week for those who are providing care, if they're providing care throughout that time. Unfortunately, we don't know when care exactly started and when it stopped. It just at the survey asks about care over the last two-year period from the last interview. So it could be that they're providing care full-time for a couple months, or it could be that they're going over every Saturday for eight hours over the entire period of time. And this is cumulative hours. You see, the cumulative hours goes up to about 1,400. So it's not that much higher than just the average hours before that. Because these are really fairly short spells. The average person reports for less than two waves of the survey. So maybe two years, maybe three years. Okay, but it's not that long a spell. It's not that you're doing this for five years or 10 years. It tends to be pretty short. And this is distribution of hours of care. You see the mean, at about 1,500. This is conditional, the 25th percentile, the median. And then when you get up to the 75th percentile, you're up to 2,000 hours a year. So that's really a full-time, you know, 20 hours a week is really like working at a job someplace for those people. Now what's interesting is when you start comparing just descriptive characteristics for the two groups, for those who provide care at some time during this window from 1992 to 2010, and those who don't. And I didn't put any asterisks here or anything. Every single one of these differences is significant. So those who provide care are better off in every dimension. They're younger, they're more likely to be white, they have more schooling, more likely to be working full time. They have more experience, um, they have greater earnings, they have more experience, so their earnings about 10% higher. Their experience, they have about two more years of experience. Tenure on their longest job is about one more, is one more year. A year more in covered earnings. As you can see, uh, $300 more in average quarterly earnings and their expected PIA. So any of these financial measures of SES or anything like that, those who provide care are sort of better off. So we're not really, it doesn't look like we're drawing from sort of the, weaker, the lower tail of the distribution in terms of caregivers. These aren't people who, you know, were out of work, were sitting at home, who are available to provide care. They look like they're the more active, more employed ones which is really interesting. And it's sort of this, going back to this idea of conscientiousness. 
everything we look at, there's sort of a group of people who do everything right. They get more schooling, they take better care of their health, they live longer, they have higher income, higher earnings. If we go get those variables about preventative health care, they're probably more likely to get a flu shot, let their cholesterol check, they probably exercise more, wear seatbelts more. They're sort of doing everything. They volunteer more, all those sorts of things. Then if you look at risk, those who provide care are more likely to have more parents, more in-laws, they have fewer siblings, so they're at higher risk of providing care, and they have fewer sisters. Since women are more likely to care, sisters are likely to be the substitutes. And even those measures that, again, those are all significant, the ones in italics here are not significant, but they still go in the same direction. Caregivers have higher household wealth, higher household income, and their husbands have higher earnings. So it's amazing to me to see every single variable you look at those who provide care are sort of better off than those who don't. So the first thing we do here in this regression is look at the probability of care as a function of all those standard demographic and economic variables, age, race, sex, schooling, marital status, household income, wealth, uh, things like that. And then we also include that initial experience, tenure on the, and tenure on the longest job, we find experience is positive and significantly related to caregiving. Caregivers controlling for everything else have more labor market experience than non-caregivers. They have fewer sisters. Since daughters are more likely to provide care, those would be substitutes. Remember, these are women themselves. So sisters sort of have a protective effect. And their parents are older, so that's our best measure of parental need. So it looks like caregiving is basically driven by the need to provide care for parents, not because you have this weak attachment to the labor force, even when we control for things in a regression context. And this just gives you an idea of the size. 10 years experience is a two percentage point increase or about 20% increase in the probability of providing care. And sisters have an enormous effect. A sister really reduces your probability of providing care. The next thing we do is then add those social security measures to think if you know, here is some very much predetermined measure of labor market participation. This is, you know, you're working in your 20s and your 30s long before your parent needed care. You pr could make the argument that somebody, you know, in their late 20s when they're starting their career figures they're an only child, they're going to have to care for their parent, and so they choose a job with flexibility and lower earnings because, you know, 30 or 40 years later they're going to have to provide care. That's probably not true, this is probably, you know, a good measure of the labor force attachment before the parent needed care, and you see the same sorts of things. Their previous tenure is positively related to the provision of care, number of sisters is negative related, sisters-in-law is negatively related, parent age is positively related, but those social security variables have no effect. They're not significantly, the coefficients are not significantly different from zero. So there's no evidence of this negative selection into caregiving with respect to labor market experience. Positively related to tenure and experience, the caregiving really just seems to depend on need. Do you have an elderly parent? We don't have a good measure whether or not the parent needs care. Are they older and are there fewer substitute caregivers? Okay, so now we, um, oh, we also do this separately for parents and parents-in-law. And you see some uh, evidence that there's a different effect. There doesn't seem to be much that's related to caregiving for parents-in-law. Um, there's some evidence that having a husband with earnings and having more household wealth basically frees you up to care for an in-law. That's sort of more of a luxury than caring for your own parent. So now to look at what happens coincident with the start of caregiving. So looking at people who were not caregiving in the first wave, who started caregiving in the second wave. And they could be working full-time, part-time, or not working. And you see those who are working full-time, only 72% continue to work full-time, 11% moved to working part-time, 17% are not working. There's their decline in hours, uh, 41 hours per week when they move to not working, and there's a decline in annual earnings of $34,000. In that one change, in that one period from when they were not caregiving to when they are caregiving, a similar decline in working part-time and an increase in not working, uh, a similar stability in non-working. Now, we don't, these people are getting older, and they're in their 50s and 60s, so they could just be 
leaving the labor market on their own. This doesn't say they're leaving it to provide care. So if we compare those who were caregivers in the second wave and those who are not caregivers in the second wave, we do see that those non-caregivers are also leaving full-time work and leaving part-time, uh, I'll show you in a second slide, leaving full-time work, but it's a smaller change. Those full-time workers who provide care, 17% decline, or 17% are not working versus 14%, and as we saw in the table of needs, they had a higher earnings, so they're more likely to not, um, decrease their earnings. And you see the same thing in part-time. Okay, so those who are providing care are a little more likely to transition to not working, than are those who do not provide care in the second period, 32% versus 24%, a bigger decline in earnings, and a bigger decline in hours. Okay? But there is some decline in labor market participation for both groups. So if we do this in a regression context, let's look at the probability of working as a function of caregiving with all those standard controls that we talked about before, including initial experience and uh, the social security variables, tenure, we can also do it in a fixed effect analysis to control for some undeserved measure of industriousness or how much you care about families or something like that and look to see what happens when there's a change in work. The results for all the standard variables are as you expect, age is negatively related to employment, schooling is positively related, ex previous experience is positively related, being married is negative for these women, Poor health is negatively related, and the social security measures, surprisingly, are not significantly different from zero when we control for experience and tenure. Caregiving measures are negative and significant effects on employment, okay, even controlling for all these things. The um, employment zero, one, working, and hours, and negative but not significant effects on earnings and mixed effects on conditional earnings. So just to show you those coefficients, the uh, dependent variable is working, zero, one, whether you're not, you're working. If you provide care, you're 4.6 percentage points less likely to be employed, 6.1 percentage points uh, with Social Security, and in the fixed effect model, 2.9 percentage points. You see a similar significant effect on hours worked, and then a weaker effect on hours worked conditional on being employed. Where we don't see any significant effect, but we do see a negative effect, is on earnings. I, annual earnings is negative in each of the specifications, but not significantly different from zero. And the effect of uh, caregiving on conditional earnings is negative in the fixed effect. None of these is significantly different from zero. Tenure and experience, obviously, are still positive. So that's sort of what we see going on contemporaneously with the provision of care, looking from one wave to the next, looking at a point in time. Now we want to turn to looking at long-term outcomes, sort of what happens over this period of time. And that's, in some sense, what we care about. If you're taking a negative hit for a year or two, it's not that horrible. So what happens, though, 10 years from now? Do you recover? So we're going to control for a lot of the initial conditions in 1992, whether or not you ever provide care, and what happens in 2010. Okay, so first, just looking at the means, the two different groups, non-caregivers and caregivers, you look at the change in wealth between the two waves, both groups go up, but those who are not caring have a greater increase in household wealth. They start at a lower level, remember they were the caregivers are sort of positively selected, but those who don't care have a greater increase in wealth. Those who are providing care have a larger decline in household income. They have a larger decline in earnings, a larger decline in the probability of working, larger decline in the probability of full-time working, part, uh, smaller decline in part-time working, and a larger decline in hours worked. So even though they start out as the more selected group, ten, looking 10 waves later, 20 years later, they're, they start being worse off. They've sort of fallen behind. And remember, this caregiving is not that they've been caregiving this whole time. This is typically one wave reported caregiving or two waves, so about 1,000 hours in total over this time, 1,500 cumulative. So it doesn't seem like that much over this whole period, but they do fall behind. And since they were better off to begin with, that really sort of says something, that these are the people who out their whole lives have done better, and now they're doing worse in that period. 
So in the regression context, we can look at the probability of working in 2010 as a function of whether or not they ever provided care and all those standard variables and our social security measures. Okay, and here, we, if the first one, whether or not they're working in 2010 is a function of whether or not they ever provided care. Uh, that's supposed to be a 0 0.24. There is not significant, but their annual earnings now are significantly lower in thousands of dollars. Their annual earnings condition on zero are significantly lower. Okay, so these women have taken this long-term hit to their earnings, okay, about fourth, uh, about uh, four thousand five hundred, four thousand six hundred dollars a year, or conditional on working, a little over twelve thousand. So what we see is caregivers are not drawn from those with weaker attachment to the labor force. They have greater experience, greater tenure, more schooling, sort of all the right things. But caregiving has a negative effect on their employment that we found in the past, and it has these important long-term consequences. They're less likely to be working years later they have lower earnings, their household wealth has not increased, their household income has gone down. So it really does have a long-term impact. So what this means going forward, we know that recent, more recent cohorts have had lower fertility rates. So there are fewer children. So you're less likely to have that sister who's going to step in and bail you out. So it's going to have more of an, you know, if we look at the population as a whole, this is going to be more of an important problem. More women are working, so we're going to have more of them with higher earnings and greater opportunity costs of those caregiving hours. So the aggregate lost wages for the economy can be much greater. And as I talked about, these changes in disease-specific mortalities, these sort of increase in the likelihood of developing some sort of dementia or cognitive problem that really requires long periods of, of long-term care. Remember, these were, uh, I think the median was 1.8 uh, surveys of care, so about three years worth of care. If you move to a regime where more and more people are getting care for dementia, that time's going to extend, so you'd expect the negative effects of this caregiving to extend. So thank you. So thanks, John, um, for inviting me to be part of this conference. And thanks, in particular, for inviting me to discuss this paper uh, for two main reasons, or I enjoyed reading it for two main reasons. One is that it allowed me to combine my um, working longer and retirement research persona with um, my other research persona, in which I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, female labor supply at the beginning of the parent-child relationship. And so it was really interesting to take this perspective of thinking about caregiving sort of at, at the end of the parent-child relationship. Um, and then also, uh, I enjoyed reading the paper because I think this is a great contribution to what we know, um, both in terms of a lot of really interesting descriptive work, but also in really pushing the ball forward uh, in terms of what we can say more causally about the relationship between parental caregiving and um, female labor supply. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time summarizing the paper, and in fact, Kathleen sort of left us with exactly the important takeaways that I had from reading the paper. But I do, I, so I won't say all of these in part because I know I'm standing between you all in lunch. Um, but I do want to reiterate this first bullet point um, and give it even more emphasis because I knew it. I, I knew that women were providing most of the parental caregiving, but the numbers are just shocking. Um, and, you know, it's 46% of the women in her sample who are, you know, between the ages of 52 and 72 that are providing care at some point. But if we think about uh, broadening that to women that have to do this uh, probably earlier in their lives um, and maybe are, are having to do this, you know, multiple times, this is a really big burden. Um, and so, you know, tons of women are at risk of this and we should really care about what this means for their labor supply, particularly at this important juncture in their lives. Um, and so I'm going to skip those other things because Kathleen just told us about them. So uh, first I want to make some quick suggestions about things that they might be able to do with the data. So they do a great job of overcoming um, the selection problem. They really make use of the HRS data and its unique features. To do that, as she described, the, the concern with selection is that um, it might look in the descriptive data, although it doesn't necessarily in their descriptive data. But prior to this, I think there was a sense that um, women with low labor market attachment were the ones, uh, you know, 
women whose labor supply was lower were the ones doing the caregiving. And that could be because um, it's just the women with low labor market attachment that are um, choosing to do the caregiving. Or it could be because the caregiving has a negative effect on the female labor supply. Um, they use, as she described, they use various measures of lifetime labor supply and individual fixed effects to try to get around this uh, selection bias issue. And what that means, particularly in the fixed effects models, is that the identification is off of shocks to labor supply that are concurrent with uh, sh you know, changes in the parental caregiving that these women are doing. Um, and that led me to the question um, of what if there are negative effects on children of parents needing care in addition or separate from the potential effects of being the caregiver itself. So you cited the Wolf study, right, that suggests that there are these other negative effects of having a parent enter into a state in which he or she needs care. Um, I don't know if you can do this in the HRS, and something that you said in your presentation makes, you, makes me think that you can't. But one suggestion is to try to control for any negative health shocks to the parent separately from tr controlling for the caregiving that comes along with those shocks. Um, you, something that you said in the presentation made me think that you can't do that in the HRS. I don't know enough about the HRS to know for sure. But maybe they collect information on death of a parent, and, and that could be sort of Maybe that's the best you can do, but that would at least be a proxy to sort of separate out the effects of um, you know, a parent and entering into this really horrible state from the fact that you're actually doing the caregiving of the parent too. Um, right, so this is great data and really interesting, although as Kathleen pointed out, um, this is, it's, it's tricky data because this is a richer question than I have the sense that we get any in any other data set. Uh, it's more information about caregiving than I think we have in most places, but it's still limited because they only ask a sort of question about how many hours in the last couple years. And we, as she pointed out, we don't know whether those hours are concentrated or whether they're strung out, you know, over the course of the two years. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to just, I was trying to think of things you could do maybe to get at these different types of care, which I expect will have different effects on female labor supply, right? So if I think about taking care of a parent for two or three months really intensively, that's going to have a different effect on my labor supply than sort of, I, I call them here the weekend warriors, right? The women, women that are doing this for eight hours a day every Saturday or something. Um, and so I, you know, a really easy way to think about doing this or at least get started even with the data that you have is to try to think about the caregivers that are reporting different numbers of hours, right? So you mentioned your 75th percentile is, uh, of hours of caregiving is really high. And so maybe looking at the effects, the negative effects of that type of caregiving separately from uh, the negative effects of much lower levels of reported caregiving over the two-year period. Um, and then also I, I found myself wanting to know more about the decrease in labor supply. And again, here we're limited by the data. And I think um, you guys do a lot to, uh, you do a lot with a little bit of information, but one thing that you might also think about doing, you know, I wanted to know is this, is this, and this is sort of a theme that's been talked about over the last couple of days, is this sort of uh, quick and total exit from the labor market? Uh, you know, when I have to take care of a parent for two or three months, you know, is that it? Do I, can I not work anymore? Or is this, um, you know, you mentioned bouncing back and forth, is this exit and entry, and it's just sort of a start of a path where I sort of slowly segue out of the labor market. And you might be able to do something to sort of tease out that stuff. I mean, I don't know how, how, power, how much power you will have to be able to do that, but you could use either the information on self-reported jobs between the waves or the Social Security uh, quarterly earnings data to maybe get at sort of what does that decline look like in those way, across those two waves where you see the caregiving start. So those were just some quick suggestions about the data. And I want to sort of end with a few thoughts that um, build, upon, build up on your sort of intro and then your last slide, which I think you did a really nice job of in the presentation and, and, um, and even better than what I saw in the paper where some of this stuff was touched on too. But I think, you know, so I, I found myself thinking a lot about what are the broader effects of caregiving. So this is something that you mentioned in the talk, but, you know, the focus in the, in the talk and in the uh, paper is largely on labor supply and earnings. But really, we can think about um, like the whole package of financial well-being, right? And you mentioned this a little bit. Um, and I think you probably have intentions to do this, but I want to encourage you uh, to, to do so, which is to think about 
you know, what's going on with, um, you talked about DB pensions, but also what's going on with Social Security income. If these women are stepping out of the labor market, does that mean they're actually going ahead and claiming? In which case, we know they're going to be leaving uh, money on the table from Social Security. And so that could be hurting them. You might want to look at their overall sort of wealth and stuff, which, you know, I know you have all this information in the HRS, and it sounds like you've been thinking about these things. So I just want to encourage you to do it, because really, um, we're thinking about the whole picture for these women. We should be thinking about the whole picture in terms of their financial health. And then something else you touched on in the talk, but um, I didn't know about beforehand, <laughs> was the, that you're writing a second paper on what's going on with the male caregivers. And I found myself really wondering that when I was reading this paper, in part because, as I mentioned, I think a lot about female labor, supp labor supply um, earlier in the parent-child relationships. and um, there we know there are big differences in how child bearing and child rearing affects the labor supply of men and women. And I wondered if that's going to be true here. And if so, whether that tells us something about the nature of what's going on that could be really interesting. And so it'll be interesting to see the next paper and to see what those comparisons across gender look like. And I wonder if in doing those comparisons, you might be able to tease something out of the various parent-child um, and parent-child and or child parent parent and child parent in law relationships, right? Um, for example, do men take on more of the burden when the parent that needs help is their parent rather than their spouses? You know, those kinds of comparisons could be really interesting, even just in the descriptives. Um, so then uh, in terms of other ways to think about expanding and broadening this, I was trying to think about what this means for the broader population. and. The sample that you use is a, is a really important sample to think about, particularly when we're thinking about working longer and how to encourage um, people or women, in this case, to work longer. Um, but it is a particular group of women, and it specifically it includes uh, women who are not already caregiving, who, but who have a parent that's still alive. And I think this means something particular about the relationship of the age of the parent at birth and the health of the parent, both of which you touched on, at, uh, sort of touched on at the beginning and end of your talks, but I I'd love to see more discussion of that, maybe comparison across cohorts and these things that tell us more about sort of how generalizable this uh, estimate might be. Um, and then similarly, you touched on this too, but right, this sample includes women aged as 52 or more in 1992. Those are the cohorts born before 1940. We know there have been big shifts in female labor supply, and in particular, in female attachment to the labor, support, uh, labor force early on in their career. Um, and so just some hints about what we can learn from earlier life behavior about what might be feeding into this, for, the, for example, for the women that are currently in their 50s. And that'll help us think about, uh, as you talk about in the paper, potential policies that we could design to um, help uh, families through this difficult time. Um, and then, you know, I know this conference is about working longer, but in part because of what I think about um, in other aspects of my research, I, I found myself wondering what we think about the representativeness of these estimates for the broader population of women, particularly as um, pe people are having children at older ages. Um, it might be the case that some women are experiencing this earlier in their lives than when they got to their 50s. Um, and uh, it's just interesting to think, it, it would be interesting, although maybe it's a totally different paper, but to think about these effects as they happen uh, at different points in, in um, the women's, uh, you know, lifetimes. Um, on the one hand, the effect of caregiving, you know, that has to take place before you're in your 50s could be bigger if you have to step out of the labor market for some reason, and that negative effect that you're seeing here compounds over the life cycle. Um, but it could be smaller if there's more time to rebound and get back into the game and um, you know, make up things like your social security benefits and those sorts of things. Um, it also could be smaller if there's less elasticity in jobs earlier in your career, right? So that if you can't really just sort of take a, a halfway step out earlier in your career as easily, you might look for other care solutions in ways that you might not if you're in, your, um, in the years that are closer to retirement. So those are... Um, all of my thoughts. Uh, it was a great paper, and I really enjoyed uh, reading it and thinking about these issues. Thanks. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, uh, just a couple more more things, Kathleen. This is a sort of very rich foray, and uh, and I think there are a lot there there are other things that come up. One of the things that occurred to me was that a lot, particularly in these cohorts, a lot of the women who were working were working in in caregiving occupations like nur nursing and and things. A lot of the younger women that are not in the original HRS cohort are going to be in. In a, in a much broader range of, of occupations, and it's inter it would be interesting to know, what, you know, how much difference th that that may have, the, the kind of occupation might have made. And there's, and I think you could easily introduce that. Another question is, you, the, the basically you're the these very active women who who uh, are the biggest caregivers is also kind of a question. I was thinking you. Yeah, Kathleen did a lot of work to develop the location of of parents versus children and and siblings, and I, I don't think you could use that kind of information consistently over the whole whole panel. But one of the striking things that came when when looked is that for many American families, lower lower particularly lower education families. Uh, Pretty much everybody lives within 10 miles of one another. So if you've got a sister, <laughs> the sister is going to be readily available to substitute. On the other hand, if you go to a group like this, my guess is that the distance between parents and children and, and one sibling and another is much is much greater. Uh, one of the things, and, and, and it would be interesting to know sort of how that locational um, Thing works in particularly in conjunction with the uh, w with what you're finding is that the caregiving of these of these high high performing women uh, is 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 so much greater. Uh, one of the, another thing that occurred to me is that one of the roles of these the, these high performing women is is the kind of the physical setting in which you could care is much. My guess is that much of the caregiving that's taking place is either caregiving to a mother who's living nearby, but still in her own home, or it's a mother who, or father, uh, who is is living in in the home of the in the home of the uh, of the caregiver, and the care and and the ability to do that would depend on things like the size of the house, uh, the capacity to, for example, care for a mother. Uh, or father who's um, uh, as a, as a weekend activity it might mean that you would hire some caregiving as well as caregiving for yourself. So it seems seems that there's you could start to think of the production function for home <coughs> home care, and that may well be related to the uh, uh, wealth of the family. So so those are just some extra suggestions, but they're terrific paper. Thank you. Can, may I just? Say something. Um, just because it's come up with both people, I did want to say Sean and I have a forthcoming paper in a uh, MBR conference volume sponsored by Sloan, looking at cohort differences. And you're right; more recent cohorts face a greater cost of care, with perhaps a different occupations and so forth. You will take one final question. So uh, Medicaid is willing to pay for nursing home care for people who are poor enough, which is really expensive and probably often unpleasant. Should Medicare, I mean Medicaid and maybe even Medicare, be willing to pay your daughters to do, I mean the daughters in your sample, to do what they're doing? These daughters, of course, would be better off if they were paid by Medicaid because they're now doing it without being paid by Medicaid. And other daughters or sons might be willing to do it if they could get some financial help and not put grandmother in the nursing home, which I suspect would also save Medicaid a ton of money. Is that something that's been proposed or thought of? Going back a long time ago, there was this difference. Uh, when George Pataki was governor of New York, he cut back on Medicaid um, funding of home health care with the argument that families will do it so the state doesn't have to pay. At the same time, Bill Clinton was arguing for the expansion of Medicaid funding of home health care to keep people out of nursing homes. So I don't think we know enough yet about the elasticities, about which way it would go, who would be helped most, and so forth. But hopefully, we can start getting at some of this. The, the means testing is pretty strict for Medicaid, and there are differences in nursing home quality. 
Good. So I think we'll break for, break for lunch. I'd like to start the session at 10 after 1. This is even a little earlier than scheduled. But I'm a little sensitive about the quantity and quality of the audience for the final paper. So I'd like to get that uh, on time and we'll end at, the goal will be to end at 2 p.m. <laughs>